tout d'abord Okay, 
Distinguished colleagues, delegates, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the fifth dialogue on action for climate empowerment. Five years ago, in 2012, parties adopted the Doha work program on Article 6 of the Convention and agreed to organize an in-session dialogue annually to provide a regular forum for parties and stakeholders to share their experiences, exchange ideas, good practices, and lessons learned regarding the implementation of Action for Climate Empowerment. This year, the dialogue on Action for Climate Empowerment will focus on the areas of education and training, as well as on international cooperation as a cross-cutting theme. Education and training are fundamental for transition towards low emission and climate resilient development. Last year, parties undertook an immediate review of the Doha work program on Article 6 of the Convention and identified that progress has been made by parties and other stakeholders in planning, coordinating and implementing action for climate empowerment. The results demonstrated that some countries have established climate change education as a standalone subject in their curriculum, while many others have incorporated climate change education fully into the environmental curricula in the formal education system. This is a fundamental step towards fostering a climate educated population. Training, training was also recognized as a critical component. Many countries and organizations reported that they are currently facilitating training courses and knowledge transfer on climate change related issues, including adaptation, disaster risk reduction, renewable energy, energy efficiency, sustainable urban planning and eco buildings. During these two sessions, you will have an opportunity to share your experiences, exchange ideas, good practices and lessons learned on education and international cooperation. To kick off the dialogue, I would like to invite you all to watch a video message from His Excellency Mr. Hal Salahadin Mezwar, the COP22 president, who sends his regrets that he cannot be here to deliver his message in person. Je voudrais tout d'abord souhaiter la bienvenue aux participants au cinquième dialogue sur l'action pour l'autonomisation climatique qui portera cette, cette fois-ci sur deux questions essentielles qui sont relatives à l'éducation et à la formation, mais également à la nécessaire coopération internationale. Je voudrais vous saluer et vous dire combien la présidence marocaine est attachée à la dynamisation et au renforcement de l'action en faveur de l'éducation et de la formation. Combien le rôle de la jeunesse et l'implication de la jeunesse et au-delà naturellement de l'ensemble des acteurs, qu'ils soient des acteurs étatiques ou non étatiques, dans ce processus est fondamental. C'est un combat, on le sait tous. C'est un engagement collectif et on le sait tous. Et cet engagement nécessite de l'action. C'est pour ça que la présidence marocaine a inscrit la COP22 sous le signe de l'action. Parce qu'après l'accord historique de Paris, il était nécessaire d'orienter les efforts d'orienter les énergies vers l'action. Mais il était aussi fondamental d'intégrer dans ce processus l'ensemble des acteurs non étatiques, société civile, entreprise, territoire, jeunesse, et combien on sait que leur rôle est important dans l'accompagnement de cette ambition planétaire que nous, dans laquelle nous sommes inscrits tous. Euh, ce combat planétaire qui est de long terme, nécessite naturellement euh, une préparation de toutes les générations, la sensibilisation également. Et nous savons combien c'est fondamental pour la réussite de notre action, notre action commune. Et donc, euh, c'est un appel que je lance aujourd'hui pour que l'ensemble des États, l'ensemble des acteurs, étatiques ou non étatiques, s'impliquent encore plus dans ce combat, donnent les moyens nécessaires pour euh, 
la mise en place des politiques nationales, la mise en place des points focaux nationaux, la mise en place des politiques nationales, mais aussi de la nécessaire coordination internationale autour de cette question combien sensible et combien importante. C'est aussi une occasion pour lancer un appel à toutes les organisations, les fondations, les États, les acteurs, pour soutenir financièrement cette, ce processus. Nous savons que la finance est le ciment de la continuité d'une action. Et nous savons combien cette action a besoin de soutien financier, d'engagement financier, qu'il soit celui des États, des fondations, des organisations, parce que c'est un beau combat. C'est un bon combat pour l'humanité, c'est un beau combat pour notre chère planète. Je vous souhaite un excellent débat. Je vous souhaite le plus grand succès à vos travaux. Merci. Well, dear colleagues, you've heard from the COP president, His Excellency Salahedin Mezouar, and it now gives me great pleasure to invite the UNFCCC Executive Secretary, Her Excellency Patricia Espinoza, to deliver her opening remarks, and also to launch the Young Climate Fellowship Program in collaboration with Mr. Jakob Rinner, the Vice Rector of the United Nations University Institute for Environment and Human Security. Patricia, you've got the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Dear friends, I want to start by thanking our friend uh, Thomas Khrushchev uh, for chairing this meeting and for your welcoming re remarks. I also want to thank Mr. Jakob Rinner uh, from UN University and all the speakers who will be contributing to this discussion today. And I, I do want to also recognize the effort by our Climate Change Secretariat Action for Climate Empowerment ACE uh, for organizing this year's dialogue on climate education, training and international cooperation on these issues. Indeed, as Thomas has just uh, underlined, education and training related to climate change are integral to the successful transformation to low emission, sustainable development and communities that are resilient in the face of climate impacts. Young people and all people pursuing their education must understand the climate change challenge and be part of the solution. Consider how much science, research and innovation happens in educational institutions. We must integrate climate and sustainability into education. Training is also very important. Training ensures people and communities can thrive in the transition to a low emission economy. It grows the number of workers in clean energy, the green economy, and other areas that benefit from a climate smart workforce. This opens opportunity at a global scale. Cooperation on these matters accelerates action and adds to the momentum. I welcome the cooperative spirit that underpins this ACE dialogue. This is a platform to showcase and share good practices among governments and stakeholders to turn commitments into action. This is also an opportunity to strengthen action on climate empowerment. All the activities of the ACE program benefit people, youth, people who need jobs, and the general public who must be part of the solution. The ACE program has a mandate in the Convention and the Paris Agreement. And work under ACE is a step towards achieving many of the other goals of the Agenda for Sustainable Development. With last year's entry into force of the Paris Agreement, a new era of implementation has begun. Education and training are essential right now. These programs motivate and encourage people to adopt sustainable lifestyles, enable the transition to greener economies and societies, equip learners with skills for green jobs, build climate resilience in communities that need it the most, and empower people to take climate action. 
last year, during Education Day at COP23, we launched the Action for Climate Empowerment Guidelines with UNESCO. I encourage national governments and everyone working in education and training to see how the ACE guidelines can enhance your work. And because the ACE guidelines can help develop national strategies, they can also open the door for funding. We see this in the Dominican Republic, and I salute the delegation of the Dominican Rep Republic, where their national strategy has formed the foundation for funding support and brought climate change into their curriculum. This prepares the next generation to take action and must happen in more countries. I invite every nation and everyone here to consider these guidelines to raise ambition over time. Share these guidelines with your peers. I also invite all governments and stakeholders and everyone here to strengthen existing partnerships and find new partners for climate change education and training. In this dialogue, all voices are welcome. Together, we can transform reality on the ground. This transformation starts with an earnest discussion. A good education opens opportunities and positions the next generation for success. Excellent education helps our children excel and achieve great things. We must do everything we can to mobilize funding for climate education, training, cooperation, and all ACE activities. This is how we can make education excellent. So today, as we kick off this year's ACE Dialogue, I am honored to launch the UNFCCC and UN University Early Career Climate Fellowship Program. Young, qualified professionals from developing countries represent one of our best resources for building capacity for climate action and sustainable development. Significant effort and resources go into building capacity and comp competencies in promising young professionals from developing countries. Yet many of them struggle to find good jobs because they lack relevant work experience. We are partnering with a UN university to bridge this gap with the Early Career Climate Fellowship Initiative. United Nations University, and I thank Jacob Reiner for that, can recruit and screen promising young professionals from developing countries, and the UNFCCC can put their talents to use. We are excited about this new collaboration. Experience and insights from being part of this process will help these aspiring and talented professionals contribute in their countries and contribute to our shared global goals. I want to thank Jakob Reiner for his leadership and for collaborating with us. If parties or any of you are interested in contributing to this exciting effort, just contact Adriana Valenzuela or any of the Secretariat staff here. The launch of this program is an excellent way to start this ACE dialogue. I am sure we will hear many ideas and examples that can help mainstream climate change into educating young and training, uh, and training workers for the 21st century economy. These dialogues and the real world progress that should follow puts us on the path to the vision outlined in Paris and it takes us closer to delivering the benefits of sustainable development to every person on the, pla <clears throat> on the planet. We must work quickly now to move the world closer to climate safe, sustainable development, where opportunity is open to all and peace and security can flourish. I thank you all for your attention and I wish you a very, very productive dialogue. Thank you very much, Madam Executive Secretary. I now invite Mr. Jakob Brinner to take the floor. Zoom is too big. 
uh, Executive Secretary of UNFCCC, dear Patricia, SBI Chair, distinguished colleagues. First of all, let me thank UNFCCC for this opportunity to cooperate on a tremendously important issue. Uh, young people are going to inherit our planet and uh, it is them to build, uh, who have to build on our successes, but who also have to make up for uh, what we did not reach in this, uh, in, the, in, the, in this generation. And it is our job uh, to listen to them and to build on their ideas. However, still too often, uh, young people lack the opportunities of uh, being heard and uh, they're not sufficiently present at the tables where important discussions are made that influence uh, their future. This is particularly true, as uh, we all know, for people from developing countries. They are grossly underrepresented in uh, many of the important bodies, although uh, they are as excellent uh, as anybody else and they are just as qualified and talented. But uh, it is often lack, a lack of infrastructure and insufficient funding that prevent hopeful candidates from accumulating work experience, uh, as you have said, and uh, to create uh, actually an experience gap in this way uh, which hinders them uh, from uh, competing in an appropriate way uh, with scientists from so-called developing, uh, often mostly meaning uh, wealthy countries. And it does, at the United Nations University we are committed uh, to shape the future of young people from all countries. We are not a mass education university. We are trying uh, to uh, link uh, new partners uh, to, to create new opportunities. For example, in our joint master course very locally here with the University of Bonn on environmental risks and human security, we're trying to link the academic uh, with the UN agenda, which is often quite challenging because the uh, academics often think that we are not really scientific and too applied, uh, while uh, uh, people from the United Nations often think that uh, the academics are too academic. So it's a constant interesting challenge we have. And this is what we would uh, what we would like to do. Uh, we are uh, running, for example, intensive summer courses on uh, environmental risks and resilience in South Africa, but simultaneously also here in Bonn. It is very important for us to to link different uh, people from different uh, countries. We're having. Uh, a very strong cooperation with the newly uh, emerging and developing Pan-African University, just to mention a few. And it is on this, uh, the uh, new initiative, the Early Career Climate Fellowship Initiative together with UNFCCC can build. Uh, we are trying to get the best out of UNFCCC and UNU uh, for these young people and to become knowledge leaders, uh, not just uh, here in Germany afterwards, but in their native countries and internationally. But this program can only be a start. And uh, what better place could we choose than the dialogue and action for climate in, in, in environment? And really encourage you all, uh, dear colleagues, to take, stake, uh, to take stock uh, of the possibility we have and to think about uh, new ones, uh, to create possibilities uh, for people from developing countries in new agencies and organizations and, and member states, and to improve their odds in order to create environment an environment of equal opportunity and fulfilled potential so that uh, we can all uh, reach our common goals thank you very much thank you very much mr Riner, the vice rector of the united nations university institute of environment and human security distinguished colleagues we have now an opportunity to have a family photo. So <laughs> may I ask everybody just to, to gather here. And as last year, we will be together in one beautiful photograph. So it's technical break for you to join us. <laughs> and we stay here? Yeah, we stay yeah. here. And we, ah, we stay here, OK. We just good. The idea is that you can join here. We will the executive secretary, SBI chair, the facilitator will stay here. And just please feel free to come around here.
Hola, ¿cómo estás? No sé. Es un poco raro, me siento rara que de estar sentada. No, 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 por favor. Me gustan mucho tus palabras. You need a ladder well, or a chair at least. Aquí pueden venir alguien más. Yeah, sure. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you said <laughs> you're tall. You can't <laughs> be in the back. Coco, join us. <laughs> <laughs> James, I promise we're going to invest in a wide angle lens. <laughs> yeah. Somehow it's just going to have to happen. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We need to empower Dio. To do we the need job. to empower Dio, yes. Yeah. Dio, you will be empowered now. Yeah, thank yeah. you very much, Patricia. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I need that, you know. Yeah. You're going to be around or you're going to be leaving? No, I'm running. Okay. So. so we yes. Yes. We can. Okay, okay, colleagues, uh, thank you very much. I think we will all appreciate this, this opportunity to see each other together on this picture. Um, well, I, I wish I could stay, but unfortunately, the schedule is extremely busy, especially in the week two. So, regrettably, I won't be able to stay for, for the sessions. And that's why I'm so grateful to His Excellency Deo Sharan, Fijian ambassador, who has agreed to assist me in this facilitating of the fifth action for climate empowerment dialogue so i leave you in really capable hands of of there and before you begin with your discussion i just wish you as patricia excellent excellent exchanges and fruitful results of this forum thank you over to you thank, thank you, you. It's like musical chairs, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. 
it is an honor for me to facilitate the fifth dialogue for action for climate empowerment, otherwise known as ACE, here in Bonn. Today, we will share experiences, exchange ideas, good practices, and lessons learned in relation to climate change education and international cooperation on this issue. Tomorrow, we will discuss climate training, international cooperation on this issue. The dialogue will be broadcast on YouTube, and I encourage you to all use social media as well as hashtag Ace Dialogue and Climate Action on your Facebook and Twitter accounts. Yungo representatives have kindly agreed to support social media engagement for the dialogue and to communicate questions received at appropriate times during the dialogue. I would like to start by introducing our keynote speaker, who was a top 10 finalist for the 2017 Global Teacher Prize. Ms. Mary Christine Gangwani Yahomi is a distinguished teacher in Germany. She's here with us today to speak on the role of teachers in fostering transformational change towards low emission climate resilience development. Ms. Gangwani Yahomi, the floor is yours. So um, first of all, welcome and thanks a lot uh, that I could be here today and it's really an honor for myself. I, is it? Yeah, now it's, I guess. So. Thank you. So in March 2017, a global alliance on climate change and education was launched at the Global Education and Skills Forum in Dubai. The purpose of the Alliance is to define the role of education system in helping world achieve inclusive development. As a top 10 finalist of the Global Teacher Prize, it's my duty to focus on how education as a strategy can help solve climate challenge. Climate challenge needs to be understood in the broader context of planetary boundaries. We need over the next 30 years to create a new society that lives within these boundaries and repairs the damage we have done to them. In the next 30 years, our children will become adults. So this is fundamentally their challenge, as well as ours as teachers. We need to all upgrade our mental and ethical maps to navigate this world new. Almost every activity in life is affected. Effectively responding to climate change requires all to act responsible. It is not something that we can do, leave to governments or specialists to fix. It demands of all of us that we understand and engage with what's happening. This is not just a matter of passing on and generating new kinds of knowledge. It requires a new ethic of responsibility and in calculation of values of global citizenships. Education is now a lifelong task, so we need to learn this from childhood through old age. Education needs to help us become true ecological citizens, understanding where we need to, to limit our actions and how to ensure an ethical restraints and a total protection of future generations. We need to extend education to focus on our behavior and our stewardship of our planet and to reconsider why we are here and how we should treat our world. While climate change education cannot be about every single interrelated environmental problem, addressing climate often has a beneficial impact on other problems in the comments. Education should break down and make more actionable the huge problem of the commons. For example, air pollution makes health of the community the target. Let me, in this speech, focus on children, giving, given that I am a teacher. The role of teachers in fostering transformational change towards low emissions and climate resilient developments is that we educate the next agents of change. We have an impact on the development and knowledge of children and how they will succeed in society when they are grown-ups. Because school 
we present the primary socialization system influence has enormous impact on the course of people's lives and in turn on society. So because I'm a teacher and also a researcher, I just brought you some small ecological model from Bronfenbrenner so that you just see how we can influence the environment, but at the same time, the environment is influenced us. We can change society through education. We as teachers, we can create true ecological citizens. Our response in getting children to know and understand the huge changes in the world, in their future world, including the changes required to drive a climate solution, is inadequate. For example, instead of teaching general climate literacy on science and impacts, it should be context-specific education on climate impact is more useful for children. It's difficult teaching climate change because it's just an abstract knowledge for children. Children need to play and be actively involved get to get an understanding on how the world is in reality itself. Throughout play and being actively involved, it will be not anymore an abstract knowledge, it will be practical knowledge and hands-on knowledge. This is a pedagogical challenge, but we can do this. So children need to understand and find out by themselves. This is possible throughout learning. It is action-oriented and cooperative learning. Children learn to take over responsibility and find solution for climate change by means of self-organized, action-oriented learning and participation. Throughout self-determinate action, linked to Deci and Ryan, some researchers from the academic university, <laughs> um, action and learning and participation. So it should be when they do self-determinate action that they can learn and experience belonging, participation, recognition and responsibility. These aspects are fundamental to education and to educate real agents of change in the future. We have to enable children to become self-organized learners and help students to be engaged in thoughtful discourse and examine different perspectives. Furthermore, this has been proven to increase student self-esteem, motivation and empathy, which is very important to, to learn new stuff. These factors are important to learn to take over with social responsibilities and students who perceive their teachers to be autonomy support of reported higher level of intrinsic motivation, perceived competence and self-esteem. Then it's students who, when the teachers are more controlling and have a teacher who is just controlling. So promoting greater self-determination, that is a greater sense of choice, more self-initiation behavior and a greater personal responsibility is an important development goal, and it's becoming increasingly clear that promoting self-determination to the avenue to attaining outcomes such as creativity, cognitive flexibility, and self-esteem. Autonomy support by teachers begins with taking the child frame of reference. By understanding a child's motivational and cognitive starting point, we can relate to him or her in a way that encourages internal motivation for engagement in the education enterprise. It is difficult just teaching climate change. Most children are exposed to some talk about climate change and may associate real climate shocks with knowledge that these may be connected to climate change. Yet, even climate literacy, as its most basic, is largely absent from curricula. When presented, climate change is usually an extra and often decent into basic scare tactics. The resulting fear is mostly debilitating and plain disempowering. At the same time, because some areas of climate change are tricky to understand, the teachers themselves have less adequate knowledge and feel that they have other set priorities. Little is done beyond this but it should be a focus of education 
to be a true ecological citizens, to take over responsibility for our world and to take over responsibility for climate education. Climate education should focus on the skills and knowledge needed to solve the climate crisis through building roadmaps of action and implementing them. These skills extend to almost all fights. What should we focus on? We need this learning and teaching to cover three broad areas of climate literacy. Why the climate is changing, climate science, how we can try to manage the change and reserve it, and how we will need to adapt to its impact. The action-oriented concept recognizes that knowledge acquisition is more effective, more sustained and more multidimensional. For example, learning station that addresses a specific climate theme. At learning station, children can work individually or in groups to solve, experiment and research and relate into practice to, pa to a part of an assignment focusing on one of these three challenges. The basis for changing education to more active student involvement is much broader than the need to supply the accounting profession with graduates who possess wider skills and comp competencies. Active student engagement is seen as an essential ingredient to all student learning and the developing of lifelong learning skills. Pedagogically, this educational experience is an integrated one with every subject having a relevance. Also, it is scaled across age development so that all the children start to grapple with more detail. I would also like to talk about the body and the value of activity as one of an example. Enhancing an active and physical lifestyle can reduce the air pollution. What can we do? One empirical fact, which you see here, is that if we get the children physical active in their daily life, they will be physical active when they are adults. They won't use a car. They would use a bike to come from one place to another. And if they are not using the car, we avoid air pollution, at the same time promoting physically active lifestyle, which, which is very important for an overall positive development of children. It's connecting to cognitive abilities, to the personality development, and to feel have a good feeling about themselves. And also, when you do physical activities and do it by yourself, you know that you can solve a problem. Physical self-concept as a central role in promoting health-related physical activity and exercise should be focused and practical. So my conclusion is, as a teacher, and as a researcher, education as a key role to create true ecological citizens and that it's students taking over responsibility for the environment. Intercultural exchange in the classroom is, is essential and necessary to educate global and ecological citizens. However, we have a huge backlog and have started to address this challenge. An international focus on, internet, in, on education and climate change is overdue. I call on the stakeholders to support teachers and the students to combat the climate change. Learning in school should be connected and should be context related and interdisciplinary. For this, we need more teachers in school, more team teaching concepts, and more psychological training in university. It's not all about the subject. We should learn how kids start learning and it should be more the focus. And most important thing, it should be also in the curricula. If you want to combat the climate change, we need to stand up now because time is really running out. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Mary Christine, for that inspiring speech. But I would like to invite Ms. Paula Caballero from the World Research Institute to share some reflections based on experience working with NDC partnerships. Challenges, opportunities, and recommendations for integrating education and training into NDCs. Ms. Caballero, you have the floor. Thank you very much, and thanks to the organizers for having invited the World Resources Institute to join you here today. Um, I 
will clarify though that I will speak from a broader experience than just the NTCP. The NTC partnership, which many countries around the room are now members of, was launched in November. And education is certainly a very key part, but it's a country driven uh, exercise and undertaking. And at present, um, the education component is one that, with, as with other elements, is being really rolled up and, and started off within the different countries that request support and that have seen this as a key part of delivering their NDCs. Let me then say that we do see that education, a capacity building training, is going to be a very key part of the NDCs and one area in which we expect the NDC partnership to be playing a very strong role. One of the pillars of the NDC partnership is focusing on knowledge and research and really being able to not only surface and understand the processes, the lessons, the experiences that come from this brand new undertaking that we as a human global society have embarked on, the NDCs, but also to understand that for actual implementation in country, being able to have and to build up the right kind of capacity, the right kind of expertise is going to be fundamental. I think that those who have preceded me have made a very compelling case for the need for education in curricula, the need to ensure that education and training is really leaves no one behind and ensures that all countries have equal access to the kind of expertise that is needed. So let me, um, in keeping with what was the mandate for this session, give you uh, three reflections of areas or, or approaches that we have seen as being very critical to build up that the right kind of capacity and uh, and expertise in country. The first one is that the continuity is fundamental. We see very grave issues of brain drain. We see that the best and the brightest that get the capacity, get the training, often leave government, leave the institutions where they're most needed. So we need to really think about also institutional capacity building and how you create not just the opportunities for the training and for the capacity, but incentives so that um, the, the best and the brightest really stay and help to drive forward these incredibly complex agendas. So the need to build up the institutional capacity, I think is one of the, as, as a very key area. If that's a key area, what are elements that we have seen? One that works very well is to avoid uh, the use of external consultants and rather if necessary, if additional capacity is needed to embed staff in different ministries, oftentimes for a complicated agenda, an intersectoral, multidimensional agenda, such as climate change, being able to embed um, experts across different ministries has shown to be uh, very productive. Um, another very critical aspect is to create a capacity for trainer of trainers. And I would say this is at many levels. It goes from uh, specific training and capacity building around very concrete or tangible areas of expertise, all the way up to peer learning. Uh, within the NDCP, the number one question that we are getting from all countries is, what is everybody else doing? Uh, so there's a great deal of interest in knowing what other countries, what other um, equivalent systems, how they're delivering on the NDCs. Uh, so we see that this, uh, both the training of training or the peer-to-peer, -peer, as I say, at all levels, that exchange and that flow of knowledge is something that countries are, all countries are really very actively looking for. Um, another aspect to building up that institutional capacity is to really uh, focus much more on strengthening the role of local and national uh, universities and research uh, institutes. The investments there are investments over the long term. You build up the capacity and then you have resources that governments and others can call upon. It also helps very much in issues around data collection, data analysis, where that continuity is, is very important. And another area where in this world of, of wonderful metrics that we've embarked on with the SDGs, what you measure matters is an even more greater understanding today of that. Uh, building up the capacity of national statistic agencies is, is incredibly important because the data, the bright kind of data can really help. And, and if the right kind of institutional capacity is put in there, there's this uh, very positive dynamic between the generation of data that is relevant and the uptake that, that's policy relevant and helping that with the interaction between the policy and the data 
drive much more ambition, action, and a better understanding of where the opportunities lie. So one bucket is that around the institutional capacity. Another one is around who needs to be capacitated, who needs to be trained. And we need to see this uh, in a much broader setting. I think that um, in Marrakesh, we saw a very strong uh, action agenda. I know that this is something also that Patricia and the Secretariat have very strongly supported. Uh, we need we need all hands on deck. We're not going to turn the ship around at the speed, at the scale that we need unless you have all hands on deck. So you also, and it very speak, much speaks to what you were saying, uh, uh, Marie, about the need to make this relevant, about the need to make this about empowerment. You need to get the parliamentarians on board. I used to work at the World Bank and countries where sometimes we saw these amazing requests for loans from the bank to really drive forward green growth agenda. It turned out that it was one parliamentarian who was driving and changing how government understood and saw the opportunities behind green growth. It was one person. So again, that multiplier effect and really a need to make sure that both at national and subnational level, parliamentarians, civil society, others are engaged and see the relevance. We have to translate it. Which brings me to my third point, make it relevant. And, and here I would speak to experience more at this stage from WRI, the kind of work that we do on projects like MAP, which is creating capacity for MRV um, and other, uh, or the GHG protocol, which has had a huge amount of training and capacity building into it. And that is the fact that you have to make it relevant. You can't just have guidance. You just can't have, um, you know, roll out methodologies or approaches or tools with the best of intentions without ground truthing it to the realities of countries. So you need to make sure that whether it has to do with systems, whether it has to do with technical capacity, whether it has to do with topography, institutional arrangements, I mean, the list can be fairly long, but it has to be made relevant. So one of the lessons that we have taken is the need to really road test. I, I, I'm allergic today to the word, word pilot because it seems I think we're way over the time of pilots. We need proof of concept and we need big move. We need to move big time. But road testing is still very valid, right? So road tested, again, not as an externally driven, but working with the those who will be using whatever the data, the tools, the analysis, road testing it to make sure that it is relevant. One thing I liked very much, and I'm, I'm, uh, I just recently joined WRI, so I can say this without blushing, but somebody said to me, what I really like about WRI is it doesn't tell us what needs to be done, but it shows us how to do it in ways that are relevant. So that relevance, I think, would be another um, third huge, uh, the third ar area that I would highlight. And let me close in saying by um, saying it was a privilege to follow on your very uh, moving and very relevant uh, intervention, because it is uh, absolutely fundamental that we embed climate change in curricula, that we get everybody to understand what's at play and how they can make a change in the world. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paula. We now continue with the topic of advancing climate change education through international cooperation. The presentation will be made by members of the UN Alliance on Climate Change Education, Training and Public Awareness. Ms. Adriana Venezuela from the UNFCCC Secretariat, Ms. Miriam Terek of UNESCO, and Ms. Ilara Gallo from UNITAR. Thank you, Excellency. Good afternoon, everybody. I would like to start to welcome our speakers, also the national focal points for action for climate empowerment, youth delegates, NGOs, researchers, universities, delegates from local communities, because it's, you are the champions who are implementing climate education at local and national level, and we are delighted to have you here to have this discussion about how we can move forward this process and accelerate implementation. Today, I would like to give you a general overview about what are we doing and the role of international cooperation in this process. When we are talking about climate change, we are talking about people, the most vulnerable communities who are affected by the impacts of climate change and the six elements of Article 6, that now is called Action for Climate Empowerment, Education, Training, Public Awareness, Public Participation, Public Access to Information, and International Cooperation are essential because at the end of the day, what we need is to empower every person to take action. 
We need a cultural transformation. We need a behavioral change. And we need also to promote sustainable lifestyles. And through ACE and all the elements, we can accelerate the implementation of these international agreements. 2015 was a crucial year for the international community and for all of us. The Paris Agreement recognized in uh, its Article 12 that education, training, and public awareness is fundamental for the implementation of adaptation and mitigation actions. But also, it is recognized as part of the Sustainable Development Goals, the goal number 13, that encourages as well parties to integrate climate change education into the curriculum and to develop skills uh, and uh, human institutional capacities to address these issues. Now, with these two international agreements, we are moving forward in the implementation area. In 2012, parties agree the Doha World Program on Article 6 of the Convention. It is a flexible framework for country-driven action. It provides say, uh, different recommendations about what parties, but as well, NGOs, youth, universities, and the international community can do to enhance implementation. Some of them and the recommendations for parties are to designate and provide support to a national focal points, also to integrate ACE into the climate change strategies and policies, prepare a national strategy on action for climate empowerment, develop communication strategies, foster the participation of all stakeholders in the implementation of Article 6, but especially in climate action, and also report all the activities into the national communications. In order to support implementation at national level, in 2012 was uh, created and was launched the United Nations Alliance on Climate Change Education, Training and Public Awareness. Currently, there are 13 UN organizations, UN agencies who are members, and the mission is to promote a meaningful and result oriented uh, international cooperation. And the idea is to support parties in implementing AIDS in the different areas, the different elements, but also to have a coherence and a common, uh, a, a common action. The UN Alliance is working in different areas. Here also, after me, my colleagues will uh, showcase some of the, the activities and initiatives that they are leading. But there are examples about preparing online courses, training teachers, training different stakeholders, preparing materials. And what we want to know in this dialogue as well to the working groups is to know what is needed. You are there at national level and at local level. We need to know what is needed to support and accelerate this implementation. The UNFCCC Secretariat also was requested uh, in the Doha World Program to support the process, especially the national focal points, to digital communications, to organize annually this dialogue, as well to organize workshops to facilitate the chain of good practices and lessons learned, to uh, develop guidelines and organize different outreach activities. The guidelines that our executive secretary mentioned at the opening are, uh, uh, were developed in partnership with UNESCO. And the idea is to provide examples about how other countries and organizations have implemented action for climate empowerment. And also it provides um, recommendations about how countries can develop a national strategy uh, on this. And why to have a national strategy is important because we need to know what do we have until the moment and to have also this long-term vision, a long-term planning that allows us to combine that A, support implementation of the NDCs, NAP, and other climate change policy and strategies. The guidelines are available on our website and also all the UNFCCC focal points and the focal points will receive a copy. Then it is a, 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 a recommendation that you can use and give us your feedback about the guidelines. Also, the Doha World Program recommend to organize different workshops to exchange good practices. And last year we organized the uh, 
first workshop for national focal points. Also, we would like to thank the northern countries of ministers and also the northern countries who play a very active role, especially the focal points, for making this possible. And this workshop was not only for the focal points, also civil society organizations participate, because in this process, everyone uh, is important. Also, we have the Action for Climate Empowerment Dialogues. This year is the fifth dialogue, and uh, it has helped also to foster international cooperation among the participants. In Paris, in 2015, we organized for first time the Education Day, organized by the Minister of Education and the Minister of Environment of France, highlighting and showcasing good practices on climate change education under crime, and also mobilizing the highest political commitment. Last year was organized in Marrakesh, the Education Day, with the participation of Her Highness the Princess of uh, Morocco. And this Education Day provides a space for intergenerational dialogue. Also, as part of the activities at the COP, we have the Young and Future Generation Day, and uh, always young people, young leaders are fostering the implementation of ACE and you are the champions of this agenda. This year we launched just uh, uh, last week here in Bonn, the third version of the Global Youth Video Competition on, on 2017. This year it will focus on climate change uh, in cities and also oceans and cities. And the idea is that young people can send three videos, maximum of three minutes, to showcase their initiative. In 2016, parties took on, uh, undertook a, an intermediate review of the Doha World Program, and some of the recommendations include, first of all, that it's fundamental to include ACE into the NAPs and the NDCs, that we need to strengthen the capacities and the skills of the national ACE focal point, to establish multi-stakeholder partnerships to foster cooperation and cross-sectoral collaboration, and also that international cooperation can ask to scale up action. Some of the future milestones include the Education Day and the Gen Future Generation Day at COP23. In 2018, parties will undertake a, a review of the NDCs. In 2020, the Doha World Program will have the final review, and in 2030, we have uh, the, the agenda, that we have this common agenda to implement the Sustainable Development Goals. The message here is we don't have time to lose. We really need to accelerate climate solutions to education. And it is an invitation that you take this to your countries, to your organizations, and help to scale action. And I hope that uh, the discussion this afternoon and tomorrow could bring ideas and suggestions about this. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. So my name is Miriam Teich. I work at UNESCO in the section of Education for Sustainable Development and Global Citizenship, of which climate change education is part um, at UNESCO. And I want to first give just a brief overview of uh, what UNESCO is doing um, with regard to climate change education, and then give a few concrete examples uh, of these activities, and then summarize with sort of um, what we have on offer to support ACE focal, focal points. Um, so, first of all, um, for UNESCO, the, the motto of climate change education is changing minds, not the climate. Um, and we promote climate change education within our UNESCO Global Action Program, Education for Sustainable Development. And some of our main activities are advocacy um, for climate change education and ESD at the global level, which includes, as Ariane said, presence at, at the COPs um, in partnership with the UN um, Alliance. Um, that's a photo of uh, our UNESCO pavilion at COP22. Uh, then support uh, to policymakers so that the member states can meet their obligations under the Paris Agreement with regard to education. The development of uh, guidance documents such as the one just mentioned and uh, other teaching and learning materials. Mobilization of schools, um, pilot projects and trainings and then the showcasing of good practices. 
So to give some, uh, first of all, just to say a few words about the Global Action Programme in ESD, it was launched in 2014 as the follow-up to the United Decade of Education for Sustainable Development, and it was formally acknowledged by the United Nations General Assembly. And uh, the overall objective is to sort of use the momentum generated by the decade and scale up um, that is the action already um, uh, already identified and generate new action to overall accelerate progress towards sustainable development. Um, some examples so of the guidance documents and teaching material that UNESCO has recently um, developed. The two um, most uh, relevant recent ones are, well, the guidelines for um, ACE Focal Points policymakers that have been mentioned several times that were developed uh, together with UNFCCC and launched at COP22 last year. And then we also have a new guide for schools um, to get climate ready that has just been published. Uh, and then um, we've also put on the slide, the because it's still very relevant, the climate change in the classroom, online course for secondary teachers. So that's both uh, available as, as, um, as a publication and online. And then also very recently, we've launched a um, publication uh, giving guidance to practitioners on how to address all 17 SDGs through education with concrete um, suggestions for activities and topics, learning objectives to address in the classroom and outside the classroom. And so, of course, climate change education is a big part of it and not only um, with regard to SDG 13. Um, then mobilization of schools is another big um, focal area of UNESCO's work on climate change education and that is done through our um, associated schools, the ASPNET, that have one, one of their focuses on climate change. And uh, ASPNET is doing, is, uh, there's 10,000 schools, um, part of ASPNET in 180 countries. And they are doing many, many, many things. And one of the recent big flagship projects is on climate change education. Um, it is now involving more than 260 schools in 25 countries. And one of these countries is Germany. And so I would now like to invite my colleague Bianca Bilgram from the German National Commission of UNESCO, who's the head of the ESC task force, to say a few more words about this flagship program, please. Project. Yes, thank you very much for this opportunity. I'll keep it very short, but I hope to, to give you the German example as well. I can make it a little bit more, more concrete. Um, the, just a few notes on the generally about the flagship project um, in the uh, within the global action program it has a very transformative approach um, due to its whole institution approach so it's trying to um, to set ESD within a whole institution approach it mobilizes all um, school stakeholders so that's the students the teachers the headmasters but also the parents and also non-formal education sector but also um, of course partners in the outside in the community um, it empowers students. It has a particular focus on empowering students to take an active role in changing their learning institution, their school, um, uh, to uh, transform to transform it towards um, a, yeah, well, a more sustainable approach and of course also their communities and their families at home. Um, the teaching and there's teaching and learning resources available. They are available also on a platform, so they're accessible to everyone. And uh, so they're being made uh, available by UNESCO and there's also a virtual platform. This virtual platform is not just an exchanging of experience and uh, material, teaching material, but also an active interchange of the participating schools and students who can uh, participate in, in, in online uh, uh, conferences. So, so far 260 schools in 25 countries uh, worldwide have taken part and I'm sure many of the member states here uh, um, sitting place also know that they're part of this uh, program and are participating and um, it's not only schools for secondary and primary but this reaches also out to other levels so there's also uh, technical and vocational institutions but also teacher training institutions and uh, also non-formal sector participates as well. Um, so, so far 130,000 students could be reached, which I think is a phenomenal number uh, considering that the program started in 2016 and uh, over 10,000 uh, 10, teachers have been trained through this capacity program. So there are, there's an international training uh, where the participating um, schools and institutions meet, so it's a strengthening of capacities um, and then they can take it back to the national level and uh, there's a peer-to-peer -peer training. So, Coming to quickly to the national level, um, 
In Germany, we have 25 schools already participating in a two-tier um, uh, implementation process. They all are developing a school action plan for the whole institution approach in their school for climate change education and um, it involves as i mentioned all um, stakeholders at school level and there's a, an evaluation and monitoring uh, program that we have added to this um, international flagship because we thought it was very important to make sure that monitoring and evaluation takes place so that we can scale up the program. So the idea is that uh, once we have tested and adapted this material and the, the capacity building, that we can scale it up to A, all of the um, ASP net schools in Germany, which are 250, but also then to make it available to all federal states. Some of you might know in Germany, we have a federal state system who are responsible for educational matters in formal education so we will make it available to all the um, education ministries at federal level so they can um, pass it on to their schools as well and top of that we are also implementing an international cooperation um, so there will be um, several summer schools and summer trainings with um, um, uh, partnership countries in in Africa also, I would like to just mention that this has been embedded uh, in a wider ESD process that has taken place, place currently in Germany, headed by the German um, Ministry of Education at national level, but also in cooperation with the um, Ministry of Environment and uh, Development Corporation and Family and Young um, young uh, children affairs and um, what they have done over the last two years since the start of the gap is to uh, come up with a big document with uh, identifying objectives activities and commitments um, for a national plan of action for education for sustainable development so this will be launched in june and climate change education because i just checked the numbers before coming here plays a huge role here because of course it's one topic of many others concerning uh, um, sustainability um, but uh, from all our um, stakeholders two-thirds address climate change and from the awards because we also give out annual awards to um, initiatives um, over 50 from our 65 our days um, our days are also addressing climate change so we see um, a huge impact there also within this um, greater framework so thank you and I hand back to Miriam now for the rest of the presentation mm -hmm. Thanks, it's nearly done. And just one more uh, example of UNESCO's work on climate change education is the showcasing of good practices, uh, which we do through our GUP website um, and our newsletter, to which you're all very welcome to sign up. Um, it's sent out every two to three months. Uh, we um, commission ESD success stories, uh, really in local, com in, well, sort of in local settings. We send journalists there to, to um, highlight good, these good practices. Um, which is also done on a platform that is called Green Citizens. Um, and then finally, now in the third year, we have the UNESCO Japan Prize in Education for Sustainable Development, where 150,000 US dollars are um, divided between three outstanding projects um, every year. Uh, and of the six winners we've had so far, there are several ones who really concretely um, focus on climate change. And then finally, um, just to sum up sort of what UNESCO we have on offer for ACE focal points, um, I think it's more or less already shown in the, um, in the presentation as well. Once again, the development of these ACE guidelines, which we really think, well, hopefully, um, really, really um, can support you um, in your work in your country. Then we try to sort of, when we have regional meetings, trainings such as for the ASPNet and others, um, to, um, to invite you as focal points um, to participate in the meetings and then also to implicate you in um, involve you um, in the dialogue in those countries which you work directly to develop national ESD strategies and then finally of course the um, providing of information resources material etc on our diverse um, websites and other online resources uh, and then I hope that uh, for the rest of today and tomorrow, we can also get um, in touch so that we also learn of what is what else is needed or, or what we should more focus on at UNESCO to support you in your work. Um, and then here you have uh, Bianca and my contact details and the GAP website for further information and to sign up also for the newsletter if you wish. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, my name is Ilaria Gallo from UNITAR, the, the UN Institute for Training and Research. I would like to thank you very much the UNFCCC Secretariat as well as the ACE um, Alliance to give UNITAR the opportunity today to showcase the example of the UNCC Learn because we think it's a, a very good example of our, um, uh, of, uh, of the, I mean, the international cooperation uh, on education uh, world. What is the UNCC Learn? Uh, UNCC Learn is a collaborative initiative, it's a partnership of uh, around um, uh, 30 multilateral organizations within and uh, outside the UN system. Um, this initiative was launched in uh, 2009 on occasion of the Climate Change uh, Copenhagen Summit. And the, 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 the goal, the objective was really to support the implementation of one of the key agenda items of the, of the convention as well as of the DOA work program. Uh, the Article 6 on climate change education, awareness and training. How do we do that? How does UNCC Learn support uh, this, uh, the Article 6? Well, we work uh, uh, at the global level as to support and raise what we call uh, the global literacy on climate change. Uh, basically, uh, we work, uh, we strive as, uh, as to share knowledge on climate change, to develop knowledge products at their basic and as well advanced level. And we have uh, an online platform through which we share this material and this knowledge. Uh, we also work at the national level. We support countries in uh, um, uh, developing regions as to uh, design and implement climate change learning strategies. What, that, what do they mean? It means uh, make, making sure that climate change is mainstream, integrated into the national curriculum, that uh, teachers and subject matter specialists are trained on climate change, and as well uh, even students at different levels, from primary to secondary to tertiary level. Uh, the UNCC Learn was launched, um, as I said, in 2009, in 2009 and then uh, um, basically it ran through up to nowadays and at the moment we are working on a following phase. In the pilot phase, um, around five countries were involved and we started to develop, as I said, basic uh, learning material on climate change. Uh, the current phase, which is soon coming to an end, so really the expansion of the support to new countries in new regions of the world, and as well as the update of some, the, uh, some of the existing materials and the production of more advanced uh, learning products. Um, a key feature of the next phase from, uh, of which I would like to draw your attention is that we would like to really mobilize additional resources as to support the implementation of the national climate change strategies. So really expand the support to countries. And we, we would like to leverage the help, the support both of the private sector uh, at the national level, but as well of the new finance, uh, financing, financial mechanisms like the GCF. Um, at the moment, as I said, uh, UNCC Learn works at the national level all across the world. Southeast Asia, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, Francophone and Anglophone countries, uh, Latin uh, Central America. And we work uh, with both LDCs as well as non-LDCs developing countries. Um, as I said already, um, uh, one of the key features of the UNCC Learn is to have an online uh, knowledge platform through which we share the, all the uh, available material uh, produced by the UN, ag UN agencies on climate change. We like to call it a one-stop shop because it really gathers all the wealth of knowledge produced on climate change so far. At the moment, we have uh, eight uh, courses at the basic and advanced level. The most uh, well-known, famous one is the UNCC Learn, UNCC Learn introductory course on climate change. This is free, this is public available, and it's available in all um, six UN languages, English, French, Spanish, Chinese, Arabic, and Portuguese. Uh, but as I said, we're also working on more advanced modules. For example, we recently developed modules on children and climate change, human health and climate change, cities, uh, Red Plus, uh, uh, climate finance. And we did that in the, in the light of this partnership, we, in collaboration with the, all the UN agencies holding the knowledge and the expertise, UNICEF, WHO, ABIDAT, uh, UNDP, and uh, recently UNICA on climate information and services. 
On top of that, we also provide services at the national level, not just, as, as I said, supporting the development implementation of climate change learning strategies, but we offer a wide range of services from tailored e-learning. For example, we worked on supporting LDC negotiators how to participate effectively in international climate change negotiation processes. We also have been involved because of our expertise into large scale programs, global support programs like the NAP, like the plus and in this under these programs we developed one-to-one uh, -one country support face-to-face -face country training uh, targeting these specific topics adaptation planning and red plus uh, another service we provide is skills assessment and specifically we design uh, methodologies and we also implement uh, missions basically we go to countries we try to understand what are the gaps in terms of skills and how do we do to address these gaps through um, skills development plans so the, the key message is, is that uh, we thought that uh, our experience experience shows that uh, uncc learn is a positive model that should be should be scaled up. Why? Because of two reasons. We saw that training and learning at an individual level can actually trigger um, a wider institutional response. I think country experiences will show that the GAN experience, for example, the UNCC Learn shows that uh, training at the secondary level actually at the end triggered uh, participatory, participatory and consultation processes at the national policy level. So it can really accelerate the implementation of the Paris Agreement as well as other processes like the NAP, the NDCs, the SDGs. The second point is that training can really trigger behavioral change. We have the experience of the Youth Climate Dialogues, an initiative was launched at the COP21, where students have to undertake the UNCC Learn modules, and by grounding their experiences, they actually um, told us and shared that they are really changing behavior. Somebody said that they, they will start to, to recycle, somebody said that they will become vegetarian. So these are just small uh, examples of how uh, training and learning can uh, change behaviors. How we, the, the wish is, is really to scale up the UNCC Learn experience. How can we do that? Well, we think that this quest should come from the parties. And we are convinced that all the country needs in terms of capacity development should be framed around ACE issues, around training, education, public awareness, because this is intimately linked with the capacity development and institutional, broader institutional capacities. And the, the key way is really to put a front on the negotiation table these issues and uh, as I said in front of new act actors like the private sectors but as well the new uh, financial mechanisms like the GCF with this I close and I invite you to visit our website well you can find all the uh, the courses I just described thank you very much thank you very much Adriana Miriam Ilaya for your presentations we now move on to today's presentation that outlines some of the good practices and lessons learned on education and international cooperation. I encourage presenters to be brief and to the point and do not exceed the great five minutes of their presentation. This will allow time for more extended exchange of opinions amongst all participants in the room at the end of the presentations. Our first presenter is Belgium's national focal point of ACE, Ms. Elizabeth Elegard, who will deliver a presentation on educational tools for a low carbon development web based my 2050. Ms. Elegard, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Am Ambassador, honorable guests. Uh, it's a real honor as a, a Belgium national focal point to talk about climate uh, education. Um, actually, we have um, a long-lasting tradition to involve non-state actors in our climate change policy, but lately we have also developed a specific program on climate education as we felt there was a need uh, to involve exactly the young generation. And it was very appealing to hear all the event interventions previously because in uh, some way I can recognize well, on the work that we've been carrying on and here we I will present you the, our educational web tool because it is in some way already an answer to some of the questions that you have been posing. But of course, it's part of a 
bigger program, climate education program that we have set in place. So just to explain you, we have the Belgium uh, federal uh, government has a, a program on um, on the development of long-term scenarios for uh, a low-carbon society by 250, where we have developed on the basis of the long-lasting uh, contribution and involvement of non-state actors, we have developed a tool for experts. That is a very complicated, sophisticated tool where each user, and it is online, can develop its own scenario by manipulating about 50 parameters, but um, we felt that there was a need to uh, simplify this version. And as a consequence, we made an educational web tool where we simplified the 50 parameters into 13 levers that are very logically uh, um, composed. And I will show you later on the web tool because it is too, um, too interesting. And why do we have... Um, uh, set up this tool is because we really felt there was a societal need to have a debate on all the options and the challenges uh, needed to um, achieve um, and well to, to show the society that it is feasible to evolve towards a low society low carbon society by 250 and how is it possible well the students they can explore and examine what are the different options and they can have a debate on the opportunities um, and by showing them uh, that deep emission reductions are demanding a big transform transformative change in our society if you want to reduce our emissions between 80 and 95 percent but by showing them that in the five different important sectors that we are involved in, you can achieve, it is technically feasible to reduce these emissions. Um, and what the students do is by choosing four different kinds of ambition levels, by staying at the current level or by choosing the most ambition level going up to ambition level number four. So we have divided these levers into technological changes and behavioral changes. And our main target group are, is the large public, but we have done an extremely big effort to translate the climate science into um, educational material so that it is usable, that teachers can use it um, uh, in class. So the, the tool is being used in secondary school for uh, pupils between 16 and 18 years old. Why? Because we feel that this is a population where you can have a solid debate uh, between the students and the teacher. And what is extremely interesting with our uh, web tool is that it, uh, you have an active involvement of the students because they, have, because they have, they can, via this web tool, develop their own proper scenario by 250. What changes are needed in the transport sector, in the agriculture sector, in the building sector? What uh, energy supply do you still need if you know that in the, in the energy demand you have a big transformation, knowing that we will go towards more electrification of the transport and the building sector? But these are important questions, but how can you make it tangible and understandable for the pupils? So we have like written information sheets, made short animation movies, where students in two minutes just get a snapshot of what, in what specific sector the options are feasible and what are the opportunities. So the students, we've tested it, they really were very, um, yeah, very attracted and, and, and immediately onto the right questions. And the reason also why is because you can immediately see and calculate what emission reductions um, every change has when you change the ambition level of one of the levers. Besides that, we have developed a manual for teacher in Dutch, French and English, which, is, which outlines what are the different steps the teachers can do and help them to use the web tool in class. And very and lastly, very important is also that there is a link with social media. So which means that the students, they can share the web tool uh, with other students via uh, Facebook or Twitter or even their proper scenario they can share with, with uh, uh, the students. Here I send you, I show you the link. It's www.my2550.be. 
I would love to show, showcast you the web too, but maybe I can have another opportunity since time is very limited. But I have left some leaflets about the, the web too um, at the entrance. So please go on the website. It is very interactive. Uh, you see the landscape, uh, which is like the landscape of Belgium, but you, you can play around with it. And the very good thing about it, and now I really want to go to the, the, the core of this presentation in terms of education, we have tested the web tool and it has been very positively received. And now we have started a really large program. We've been training and selecting climate coaches. These climate coaches that are going around the schools and they are helping the, um, the teachers and the pupils to use the web tool properly. Um, so it's in Dutch and French, it's mainly again our target group and what is interesting is that it's really multidisciplinary, it's very modular, you can use it in science and geography but you can as well use it in language classes, it's very modular, it can be in technical schools, in all kinds of schools but again the web tool is the main instrument and I can say we've been working like for two three years on it and as it is very challenging to translate the climate science to uh, the public that you are targeting to make it appealing for the students to make them an active student an active actor um, and last but not least this is a starting project and we are of course also training the trainers of course we hope that at the end um, the teachers will use the web tool by itself so again this is road testing as my previous uh previous speaker said I, we call it the pilot but i'm not allowed to say it we are road testing this and the aim is to really extend it expand it and i invite you all time is limited to look at the video message that hans brunings the executive direct director of the european environmental agency uh said about the web tool really what are the win-win uh, situation what are the interlinkages between the different levers and and on top of it that you can immediately analyze your results and see that all right you have the investments are increasing but at the end you see that the price of combustions are reducing so these are really important questions that are shared and the students um are keeping a message after uh reading seeing the web tool and of course, we are uh, evaluating and monitoring it in order to scale up the pro project. But one aspect that really, what I, what according from our experiences, is one key thing is personal coaching is key. If you don't have a personal person that knows about the subject, it's really there are major obstacles for the teachers to overcome and to tackle the issue in class. So there are still many challenges, but the training and the personal co coaching, especially simulation exercises, are very key. Now, I just put down a few questions that can be open for debate because we are experiencing that there are still many challenges in terms of how can we reach out to the less motivated teachers and the less motivated schools. I've heard UNESCO is doing a lot of efforts, but what what can we do? Are there any tools to just um, sometimes reach out to the most vulnerable schools? And that is already thoughts for, for thoughts for fruit for, for further discussion. And what happens once a climate coach has been in a class? How can we ensure that there's follow up follow up of the exercise that the students and the young people um, uh, absorb the information? But from my experience. We, the young generation, they are the ones that will have to um, realize the transition to a low carbon society. So it is a really important uh, target group that we need to keep on paying attention to. Um, despite the fact that there's a lot of material available and that is also a very tr tricky issue for our national governments. How can we make sure that the different departments work together, education, climate change and environment? But that is open for the question, but I invite you to use the web tool. Have a look. If you have questions, please come to me. It is, uh, uh, it's an honor for me to provide you further questions on the web tool as such. <laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, our next speaker is Ms. Kenza Kalafi from the Mohammed VI Foundation of Environmental Protection, who will deliver a presentation on showcasing climate education, education day at COP22. 
Uh, I have been alerted that we are running about 40 minutes late, so I would urge that we stick to the time of five minutes allocated. Ms. Kalafi, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you, Your Highness, Your Excellency, distinguished colleagues, AC Focal Points, representative of the UN organizations, representatives of the NGOs, and representatives of the youth delegations. Thank you very much for giving us the floor to present and uh, share the good experiences during the COP22. First of all, I would like to give you a brief presentation of the local context. <clears throat> Morocco is invested in proactive uh, policy related to the protection of environment. Actually, in its constitution, it has adopted for all citizens the right to have access to a healthy environment. And the Mohammedis Foundation for Environmental Protection is totally and definitely subscribing to it. In fact, from 2001, days of creation of the Mohammedis Foundation for Environmental Protection by His Majesty the King of Morocco that entrusted the effective presidency to Her Royal Highness Princess Lala Asna, the foundation's scope of intervention has been extended around an initial core activity, which is education for sustainable development. And for the foundation, education for sustainable development concerned all public. Starting from institutional decision makers to economic actors, elected people, from school learners to general public. During COP22, it, it was possible for the foundation to pull all the international collaboration and partnerships it has developed for the 17 past years. International cooperation was illustrated with a series of events and from them the flagship events uh, of the launch of the ACE dialogue and the guideline where Her Royal Highness Princess Lala Asna was a key stakeholder. Also, during this event, we have known the call of youth. The call of youth resulting from a set of recommendations, a set of 10 recommendations that were, were read by two representatives of the Young Reporters for the Environment. And just for recall, the Young Reporters for Environment is, a, is an international contest by the Foundation for Environmental Education that are also member of the ACE Dialogue and with us here today. That really makes students' voice heard through written reports and photographs. So these 10 recommendations and with the work of the foundation, we, the foundation, we gathered 71 students from 13 countries. What, is, what was learned from that is that students from different backgrounds but with a sense of a common purpose on how to reduce and find climate change education solutions. And one of these 10 recommendations were adopted by the UNFCC Youth Constituency, the Yango, and which concerns the creation of an exchange platform for qualified young advocates of the environment, elected by the Global Network of Young Reporters for the Environment, to communicate new and national ideas in the field of environment. Also, as previously, previously stated, sorry, the foundation target many public and the COP22 was, was the, also the opportunity, opportunity for the foundation to co-organize co with UNEP a side event entitled the relevance of green universities networks with two main outcomes, the initiatives of launching the Moroccan universities with UNEP and under the framework of the UPES program and the initiatives to uh, adapt the local uh, toolkit to the local specificities of Morocco. Also for the learners public, which is uh, the main target of the foundation, a concrete example that uh, demonstrates this effort is that an eco school within the Palm Grove of Marrakesh had the uh, participation of the general director of FAO and Her Royal Highness, thanks to their in-depth work on how to duplicate the ecosystem of the palm growth in, of Marrakesh within their schoolyard. Within a global institutional, a whole institutional approach, the school were able to duplicate the ecosystem with their teachers and local NGOs. Moreover, this work was uh, really uh, 
uh, has contributed significantly to the raising awareness of the local population, especially the neighboring uh, schools. And this initiative was were chosen, as Miriam said, uh, in the Green uh, Green Citizens Exhibition. And now this this initiative is traveling, will travel in September, uh, will be a traveling exhibition uh, about the as as the ninth flagship uh, ESD project. Also. Uh, and one of the successful stories is Maryam. Maryam is a young reporter for the environment, and she was chosen to deliver statements uh, at the COP22 welcoming ceremony at the high-level segment. And her speech were about the, the youth future. As a continuation of the stories of change or the good practices, we have the young students, middle, middle students from the age uh, of 11 to 21 that are addressing what are the effects of climate change education. They are taking photographs and write written reports on what are the environmental problems and issues of their in their local and everyday life. So they highlight the effects of climate change by raising their voice through arts, through an environmental, environmental journalism. Here are some pictures and illustrations. Also, we have the Lala Hasna Sustainable Cost Award, and one of the winner was working on how to uh, to, to to produce uh, USB keys uh, made by waste recycling of algae. This is one of the amazing good practices that that we had this year, and also a mean and a tool to connect different, as I said earlier, different students from different background was a YouTube channel with more than uh, 71 uh, concrete examples of 13 countries on how to, uh, to, to reduce their ecological footprints. Last but not least, uh, to uh, support our targets, we needed to develop educational tools. And one of them, for the, the, the pupils from 6 to 11 years old, we had we have games and platforms to raise their awareness on education for sustainable development. And we organize annually uh, training uh, to, to raise awareness uh, for their teachers also uh, within the framework of uh, the Global Action Program where the foundation is a partner with UNESCO. Also, we have launched tools in order during the COP22 in order to target also the large public. And we have installed in the uh, garden restricted by the foundation, Asset Moulay Abslam, uh, the name in Marrakesh. So we, we have installed some uh, exhibitions to uh, focus on education for, uh, for climate change. Also, for the, the, the target 11, 21 years old with our teenagers, we also have installed for them an exhibition to show all the, 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 the inspirations and the, the local issues, environmental local issues uh, in Morocco about this uh, field of education for climate change. Also, for the university, as I mentioned earlier, we have the Green University tool in order to, to launch the network of the Green Universities. Also, for municipalities, we have a guideline on how to uh, to manage the cost and to preserve the cost. Also, for the economic sector, we, we are enabling them to compensate their activities with a calculation tool. And finally, for the large public, we also have a tool to for cal uh, to calculate their gas, the green uh, the greenhouse gas emissions. And this tool were also uh, installed during the, the COP22 in the blue zone. Thank you very much for your attention. And for more information, please visit our website. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kensa. Our next uh, presenters are Mr. Johnny Sedler from the Manchester Climate Change Agency and Mr. Henry McGee from Manchester Museum, University of Manchester. So we now have some gender balance here. <laughs> they will be presenting us on cities, museums, fostering climate education and empowerment. Mr. Sedler and Mr. McGee, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, and good afternoon, colleagues, and thank you to our ACE colleagues for the opportunity to speak this afternoon. I'm Johnny Sadler. I'm the Programme Director at Manchester's Climate Change Agency. Uh, the agency was established in 2015 by the local government in Manchester to facilitate the development and implementation of the city's climate change policy. 
In Manchester, we believe that the first step to climate empowerment is through placing our citizens right at the heart of the policy making process. This devolved approach was adopted in 2009 when the City Council issued an open invitation to all stakeholders to work together to write the city's first ever climate change strategy. In January 2016, this approach led to Manchester committing to become a zero carbon city by 2050 as our response to the Paris Agreement. And following a programme of mass public dialogue throughout 2016, it's now the basis of Manchester's climate change strategy for 2017 to 50. The strategy is a document that, as accurately as possible, describes the city that we want to create through working together across all sectors and communities. But this is just the start of the process for educating and empowering our stakeholders. We believe that techniques should be as diverse as the people they are seeking to engage. Eco Schools is an international initiative to help citizens to start their climate journey from a young age. We promote Eco Schools in Manchester and have 91% of our schools signed up. Uprising is a UK wide initiative to support young people to become future leaders. In Manchester, their environmental leadership program provides skills and experience to help 18 to 25 year olds to become the leaders we need for global decarbonisation. And finally, Carbon Literacy is a project to deliver one day of certified training in climate change to help people and organisations to understand the subject and what they can do to act. Thousands have been trained to, to date in Manchester and the project is now expanding across Europe. Over to Henry. Okay, <clears throat> thanks Johnny. So my name's uh, Henry McGee. I'm the, the Head of Collections at Manchester Museum, which is a part of the University of Manchester. And so I'm going to talk about the potential that museums have as sites for um, mass engagement around, around climate change. Um, so museums reach very large numbers of people. Our museum alone reaches nearly half a million people a year. Um, we are trusted institutions and people come to us with a, with a hunger to learn, curious about the world. Um, and we reach people of all ages because climate change, um, education and empowerment needs not only relate to um, schools, it can be lifelong and it can also be intergenerational. So our collections span both human and environmental history, whether that's locally or globally. So we are sites for long-term thinking. So museums could slightly repurpose what they do to focus on the future as much as they do with preserving the past. So museums can also be used as sites where people can find out more about what other people value and think. So, um, right, so I'm gonna talk about uh, exhibitions that we developed in 2016 with the Climate Change Agency and with the Tyndall Centre for Climate Change Research. So we focused more on inspiration and empowerment because we know that the, in the information alone can be overwhelming or, or depressing. So we started with the proposition that we can't change our past, but we can change our future. And it, something that we do think is really important is rather than the museum just be a presenter, is to use it as a place where people have the opportunity to express what's important to them and to find out what other people think. And the image there is just some very simple like, interactives where people voted with, with plastic counters. Yeah. So just to give some sense of the reach of our exhibitions, um, so within a four month period, we reached nearly 100,000 people. 73% of people told us and one another that they care that the climate is changing. Nearly 22,000 people added their little black stickers to an interactive of representing their carbon footprint to, to, for an interactive about collective impacts. And 69,000 people told us the personal actions that they either do or would like to take around climate change. So just to conclude uh, my part, um, civic institutions such as museums present a really fantastic opportunity for, uh, form, for both formal and informal climate change uh, education and empowerment. And by working in partnership with uh, policy and strategy and with academics, we can help bridge the gap between strategy policy and people's lived experience. 
back to Johnny. Thank you. The second key point we'd like to share with you in summary is that climate empowerment very much starts with the policy making process. Local citizens and businesses very much need to be at the heart of that process right from the outset. Third key point to share is that there is absolutely no one size fits all approach. So we need to create opportunities for a diverse range of different techniques to be implemented within our towns and cities. And the fourth and final point is that we can only make the transition to a decarbonised world at the pace we need if we share our knowledge and best practice. And we believe that city to city collaboration is key to this. So we welcome opportunities to work with our colleagues from around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Henry and Johnny. Our next uh, speaker is Mr. Daniel uh, Sheffa from the Foundation of Environmental Education, who will deliver a presentation on fostering low emission and climate resilience in schools and communities. Mr. Sheffa, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador, and thank you, everyone, for uh, being here. And, uh, um, listening to me, I'm the last one here, so I'll, I'll do it short and it won't be too miserable. Um, I decided not to focus on my uh, um, uh, presentation because I wanted to maybe bring up a few other points um, that were not in the presentation. Um, I'm Daniel Sheffer and I work for the Foundation for Environmental Education, we call it FEE, uh, which is a global organization which acts as an umbrella organization for NGOs from around the world that implement our five programs. And our five programs, some of them you've heard about already today from uh, Kenza and from Johnny, um, are uh, eco schools, young reporters for the environment, learning about forests, and then two non-school-based programs, which are in fact eco-labels. One is called Blue Flag, and the other is Green Key, which works with the hospitality industry. And Blue Flag works mostly with uh, beaches, with, uh, with municipalities and beaches. And um, a, f a few comments that I, I want to make about our methodology, because I think it's very important in, our, in, in the success of our program. Um, the first thing is that we bring, um, we bring uh, a, a, a methodology which is based on positive action. And this, this is a driving force behind everything that we do. And the reason that we believe that positive action is one of the key factors for, for the success, and today with eco-schools, we've got over 50,000 schools around the world, which is over 17 million students involved in this, um, is because um, positive action and a very pragmatic approach uh, to the educational uh, process that's happening in the schools um, it, it brings, first of all, participation. The participation in f itself becomes an investment of, this, of the students. They feel invested in what, they're do in what they're doing. The investment creates an ownership. When somebody's invested in something, they feel a strong ownership over it. And the, and the ownership will bring protection, will bring that, that feeling that I need to protect something that I've invested in and I own. And I think that's, um, that's true in everything that we do, be it in a school, or in a municipality that's working with a, with a, with a beach and wants to wants to reach the uh, blue flag. Um, when we when we look at um, our work with uh, climate change, because we're because we're a global organization, one of the things that we do, and we have such an enormous network, is we we can become a very potent tool for funders to reach uh, high spread. Uh, spread uh, basically reach many, many countries around the world and many millions of children. So I'll give, a, I'll, I'll give an example of one of the things that we've done. In the past, Panasonic decided that they would contribute a certain pro mil of, uh, of, for each uh, component that, or each uh, ele electronic unit that they, uh, that they built. And with that, that money was uh, then given to us and we spread it into planting uh, tree activities throughout the world through many, many schools. Another thing that we do is similar to what uh, Kenza was talking about. We have uh, a tool that we call the Global Forest Fund. And basically, any time that we move around, and believe me, I move around a lot, unfortunately, I fly, I fly and go to many uh, places. Uh, every time that one of our activities involves travel, we compensate and any school in the world can approach us and 
get 500 euros for a, pre, a tree planting activity with an educational component in it. And um, and today, uh, to date, I mean, it's literally millions of, school, uh, of trees that have been planted through this process, be it with Panasonic or the Global Forest Fund. When we work with an, when we work with uh, Green Key, for example, with the hotel um, uh, industry, um, we um, we look for ways where they can um, uh, compensate and reduce their their emissions. Obviously, and we've learned that this has to be again done through a positive a positive approach. What's in it for me? They ask. I mean, this is a business, and that's what they ask. And we provide them uh, solutions for that, which they're happy then. To take now we can be a little uh, critical of it but in the end of the day it works um, another thing that I wanted to bring up is that when we look at our climate change education it can be linked into many other things I think somebody uh, said it before it, it doesn't have to be focused directly on the on on climate change uh, I'll give an example of this the uh, transport agency in Ireland looked for ways to reduce the amount of cars on the on uh, on the roads because of congestion, not, not because of emissions. They looked at this, and in the end, they decided to use eco-schools as a tool to uh, promote a program that would reduce uh, the amount of cars on, on the roads by cycling to schools or walking, walking to school or taking public transportation. And they've managed to uh, redu reduce the amount of cars connected into school activities by 28% in some of their uh, in some of their municipalities. Now that, if you do if you use it correctly, and that's what's happening in Ireland, is it is then connected into uh, the, the uh, reduction of emissions, and it's all part of a, a holistic approach to what we want to do. So we're reducing emissions. We're um, making the uh, schools safer for children. There's less uh, car accidents uh, involving children. The children are more healthy because they're walking to school or cycling to school, taking a, a holistic approach towards these things. Um, I think that uh, another thing that has been a key factor in what we've done is, especially in eco-schools, is that we have provided a very structured methodology, but what you put into each one of the steps within this methodology has to have relevance to the locality of the school and the culture, of the culture and, the, and the locality of the school. So just Talking about um, saving energy, um, saving energy in Denmark, I come from, I live in Copenhagen today, when you're talking to children in, in schools about saving energy in order to reduce emissions and, and, and because we're using today resources that are, um, um, uh, we're, go we're going to lose, then you're talking about wind turbines and you're talking about, um, and you're talking about switching off the uh, light when you leave the room, etc. But when you're working in Sierra Leone or in Malawi, for example, that school might not even be connected to the grid. So talking to them about saving energy in that form, it's just not relevant. But uh, helping children and communities building stoves that burn less wood, is still cons it's still saving energy it still connects to uh, low emissions. It still connects to uh, more trees uh, or less trees being cut down, and it's it's all connected. and And, and we have found that by providing a, a quite a free um, a free educational system, but with a very strict method methodology of how the steps are built, but what you put in each step is different. We've allowed for a successful program to go uh, global. So those are those were I think my five minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation, Daniel. Uh, the program allows for question and answer sessions, and I would like to respect that, uh, but bearing in mind we're running behind time. But, uh, but if there are any real burning questions that you would like to raise, uh, please do so. Otherwise, I will urge that we move into the working groups. Any questions? I see none, so oh, there is one. Please identify yourself and uh, take the floor. Thank you, Chair. Um, dear delegates, uh, my question is generally, I mean, here addressed to the parties. How do you see? Um, having ACE as one of 
the points more highlighted or more stressed in the revision of NDCs that is supposed to happen in line with the facilitative dialogue 2018? And how do you see its inclusion to be more pressing and more we get more language into the text in the final oper operationalization of the Paris Agreement? If I may give the floor to the focal point from Belgium to respond, if it's, uh, if, if you may. <laughs> Just, uh, or, or, or anyone that uh, would, sorry. Yeah, this is from the youth constituency, Yungo, Yugratna. Yeah. Uh, or, uh, oh, sorry, or uh, I'm putting on the, on, on, you on the spot, but if anyone uh, feels com comfortable to respond to that. <coughs> Well, um, as a new uh, national focal point, uh, I, I would be eager already um, to, 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 to work uh, uh, together uh, within, within the EU as, as a first day step and to see how we can uh, contribute and make the language uh, more into action oriented so that the countries themselves could, um, could translate uh, the climate action needs on education. I think that this we would welcome this, but there is a bottom-up approach, a lot of uh, work that still, if my understanding is right, still needs to be done. So it's very challenging uh, to have it already done by 2018. Um, but there is definitely a need uh, to concretize the Paris Agreement language. Definitely, yes. But I think we come from very far, so it will be very ambitious and useful. Uh, thank you. Uh, if there are no other questions, I don't see any, or oh, there is one. Please identify yourself. I'm Sana from the International Federation of Medical Students Associations and also from Yongo. I want to thank everybody for their inspiring speech. And as youth, we strongly support the implementation of climate change into education. But there seems to be some different opinions whether we should strive for advocating for the integral uh, implementation into curricula nationwide, or we should rather support small initiatives on these things, or even as non-party stakeholders, um, organize them ourselves. And I was wondering if somebody could share their views upon this. Any volunteers? Yes, Johnny. I think the key, um, you raise a very important question actually, which is what, what is the right approach? And I think as we transition from um, a place where climate change has been a fairly technocratic, technical, scientific issue to one where, this, where we need mass engagement, and we need to move into the implementation of the Paris Agreement and, and, and the SDGs. My short answer is there is no one size fits all. And I, I don't think it's it's appropriate or, or fair really to try to um, try to establish a strategy at a city level, a national level, a global level, which we can expect to work universally. Um, Manchester's experience is that some things work very well for us not in other cities um, and vice versa so what i would encourage is um, to try things be creative be inventive take risks be prepared for things not to work in your city or country but do it in the knowledge that at the very least you've tried to make things happen um, and that's why i had a slide earlier saying poet at work you know this is not this is increasingly not the domain for climate scientists the subject we're talking about today we talk to poets, we talk to music artists, we talk to young people, we talk to a range of people who have a very different perspective on this subject. And that's a, that's a piece of learning that I would encourage you all to take away and just take some risks and try some new things. Uh, thank you, Johnny, for offering that uh, uh, response. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, we, we have to press on, and I suggest that we uh, now move into the working groups. Inspired by the sharing of good practices, we will now speak into working groups. We will have 30 minutes for the discussions. 
each group will nominate a rapporteur and will report back on to this group for the workings of uh, of the working group's conclusions the five working groups are as follows working group one will be on climate change education in the context of naps and ndc's discussion leaders are miss ilara gallo unita miss uh, adriana venezuela unity triple c secretariat group two will be on integrating climate change education into national curricula discussion leaders are miss miriam terek unesco and miss tracy tolman uh, university triple c secretariat group three fo will focus on uh, focuses on uh, messaging for climate change education discussion leaders are mr max tabasio uh, atkins connect for climate connect for climate and miss sara much children you know please triple second uh, triple c secretariat working group for uh, will be deals with approaches tools and materials for climate change education discussion leaders are mr henry Magi, uh, Manchester Museum, and Mr. Uh, uh, Miss Natalie Sneda, University you know, of Secretariat. And Group 5 will discuss engagement of non party stakeholders in climate change education. Uh, discussion <coughs> leaders are Mr. Johnny Seda, uh, Manchester Climate Change Agency, and Miss Louise Davila, University you know, of Secretariat. Uh, you will see behind you the uh, flip charts uh, assigned, not assigned to your own group. So please uh, uh, get a group around those flip charts and uh, you can start your discussions. Group number one is in this corner. Group number two here. Num room number three over there. Number four and number five. Uh, Senegal, you want to take the floor? Yeah, I just have a quick question. Uh, could you kindly um, put on the screen uh, the numbers of groups and then the title and everything? Because I'm a bit confused. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Rihanna, can we screen the numbers? Thank you. 
And partners were implementing climate knowledge partners. So that, that includes also educational units and, and schools. So let's just go around and see if we can what is actually the meaning? It's quite hard. Just clean a point, but it's not working. It's not Yeah, I do have that I lead the moment of the change in the and the the schools and the schools and the and the and the 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 and the 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 I think I met your colleague last time. We have a different number of six persons from the YMCA and the Cup. And we have a goal to the houses, empowering youth, which also includes education. And I myself personally am a teacher, so it's also a special wedding for the teacher. You're teaching in Switzerland. Okay. It'll be good to know. It'll be interesting to hear how you actually apply now that you're in your own teaching. 
like is there any possibility for them to bring it in or yeah, I think you have to do it on top of the mm, I think there is like you've got space like uh, there is uh, you've got to teach things about the environment or whatever so it's always a question on how to frame it mm -hmm. I can just uh, talk about biological, biological things and that they have to learn uh, the names of the plants or whatever yeah. or I can like more talk about what human uh, like what we do to the environment and how we can have an impact so I think as a teacher if you're aware of your impact on kids you can yeah you can have an impact you can do a lot but mostly a lot of Teachers I know, they, they don't really think yeah. about this. Okay. <laughs> That's interesting. So, so maybe we're going to reach the teachers first before we can reach yeah. the <laughs> <laughs> um, So the framing is a key word, and, and, and that's where we'd like to have, we'd like to tackle the first guiding question, which is what kind of messaging could be most effective to educate people of those? So, what kind of messaging? has the most impact, can be the most convincing, and be the most um, acceptable for an, an audience that you're trying to teach. Um, so I'd, I'd like to get your uh, thoughts on that. And we're going to put down a few key words that uh, you bring to, to the discussion. Please do. Yes. Um, may I just introduce yourself quickly? Okay. Hi, I'm Mary from Germany. Uh, I'm a teacher and I'm a researcher. And my focus is always on project based learning and on action oriented learning so that the kids get to be active, so we really understand that with their body, so that it's connected to the body. Um, so Anita was also just telling us that she's also a teacher, um, but in Switzerland. Um, so, so yeah, so the first guiding question is really, you know, what is the most e effective messaging to educate people around climate change? So let's start putting down a few ideas on, on what could be effective in reaching an audience um, in, in applying teaching uh, methods. <laughs> so if, if you think in, in your own work as teachers, but also as um, knowledge providers, any ideas? What makes what could be effective in educating people? I think often it's um, the framing also means not to say the words climate change because for a lot of people this is like no, don't talk to me about climate change, not this again. So yeah, maybe like to have a clear message about it without using these words. Okay, so not use climate change. Um, and why Why do you think one has to stay away from climate change? I personally am not like this, but it's too abstract. Too abstract? Yeah, it's just like climate change. So Everybody the, knows about it, but what can we do? It so the slip is make it relatable, yes. right? And that would be the, the effective message, like making it relatable. Um, and then I've, I've got one that I think is very useful and, and it partly links to the not using of climate change is that climate change has always been put forward as a doomsday scenario that we're destroying the world and making it very difficult for us to be surviving in it. So we need to flip that around and make it a positive story. So make it a, a story of opportunity, of hope, and, and of uh, engagement, and, and like a constructive future building story. So positive, constructive, inspiring. Um, because for us sometimes one plus one is very easy, but for a child needs to be filed out actively, and the same is with climate change. 
we need to, to make it more that it can see and it can look that they are yeah, so that they understand it like for the trees it was actually perfect. So yeah, also example. also make it physical, right? So combine the messaging with physical action. Being actively involved in doing it. Mm -hmm. and not like just thinking in the mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I absolutely agree on this. I just think that like, you as a teacher, you can do that, but if there's just a little uh, number of teachers doing this, you don't reach a lot of children. So it's like first you gotta reach the teachers, and I think this is like way more difficult. Well, I mean, because climate change is such a broad and abstract concept, what I found challenging was, you know, how to compress it and make and simplify it. You know, like, what, what are the three things that you want the kids to go away with at the end of the day? And that was, that was always a challenge. So what is the effective messaging to achieve that? I'm not really sure. <laughs> um, compress. So then we can relate to it better and see how it could be a positive thing. Local. Think global, act local. <laughs> Exactly. I feel like you were just saying the opposite, though, that if you present it as a global problem, people will feel less interested. So also think local and not only global. Is, isn't that what you meant? I'm not sure. Yes, well, I suppose it's more instead of just saying it's this global problem and then people just sort of have to say almost kind of ignore it because they can't relate to it. It's just too big. See what difference it we made to make it into a sense that what can we do? Um, yeah, that's when I was teaching like I was like five years to ten year olds. It was really difficult because you know what do you want them to remember then? It was like recycle and you know turn off the lights and save water and those simple concepts that they can actually do while still trying to like explain the greenhouse gas effect and so on. It was, it was really difficult. Like explain why they're doing it. Yeah. This is the good thing to come to. But to what extent do you have to go into the whole story and explain the whole story? You have to just Okay, it's a difficult balance. Well, I, I work with kids, I wouldn't. Or I don't think that this is really what's what's really having kind of an impact on them, but maybe more specific things like the plastic islands in the sea, something like this, and they just teach them not to use uh, so much plastic bags. And this already has them, like, yeah, it's a good thing. But what about, like, creating new uh, games with this plastic stuff, like upcycling? Think positive. Yeah. Don't see it as a negative Use this what we have to create something new. So you can use, for example, some old bottles to make fitness, um, fitness exercises to, to like lift it up, and then they can start their own program. So I'm like, think positive. What can we do with it? Not in a negative way, because we're thinking in a negative way. You so, have to avoid uh, plastic and everything. It's 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 much fun. It's also <laughs> negative yeah. and also the teacher. So, so creative challenge. Creative challenge. Creative positive challenges for the students. Yes. Um, and because as I start to do by themselves, it's linked to the psychology learning process. And then the, the one other thing that I've been picking up, you know, we're talking about plastic, we're talking about environmental waste. So is is it necessary to, to stick to climate change or should we broaden the teaching concept and for effective messaging, make it more a holistic environmental protection message? Or not? I don't know. 
I really like uh, your like, idea with the, the most creative things. For example, I've seen a, a project where women, they um, take plastic pants and then they make things. Like you could have projects like this with your kids. And also for teachers, I, like not everyone wants to be reached by all this issue, climate change and so on, but they, they maybe would say, oh yeah, that's cool, let's let's do this project. Yeah. And not even, you don't even necessarily have to speak about climate change, it's just a cool thing to do. And, and I think what links to that is also future framing, mm -hmm. you know, like, and, like helping these kids visualize where we want the world to be. And that they can solve the problem. And that they can solve the problem. That they can drive electric vehicles that are powered by renewable energy. And that'll all be fine because it's not going to destroy the world. So future framing, which is linked to creative positive challenges. To self efficacy again. But I think it's like if they don't have this basic, but I think that uh, they have an impact. So, and you don't have to talk about climate change to, to teach kids that they can be self confident and self efficacy. Yeah, so it's, it's self empowerment. And they consider reflection to be own idea that is kind of based, I think, a little bit like they are doing so. It's a little bit of 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 a little bit one point I was going about the thing local like local is great for the, for the kids, also for the primary school kids, but I would still do say that they also should think globally, that they should know what happened, for example, in different cultures, in other, in other countries. Because when they get an understanding, maybe that they can also think global and maybe connect with each other through digital partnerships, through internet connections, because we are a global world already. It's, it's better to bring it that we are here one team, and all of the children are struggling with some of the same problems, but we can together bring positive examples. So that's kind of an intercultural learning with the different areas. And maybe they, they can learn from, from projects which they are doing in a school in Nigeria, for example. And and I think that links to self empowerment. You know that that they can feel empowered that what their actions locally can actually help others abroad or or vice versa. Are well, they understand maybe because there's an action in the rural area in Nigeria where all the research over there. There are not a lot of cars, but there's still a lot of activity, physical activity, which is also for the health, for the development, for the adults, but it's not process after, after what happened. So they also get an understanding, well, there are a lot of physical activity and kind of not the environment is more useful for physical activity. So we can have to think about it. How can we bring our kids to be more physical active? Yeah. Like today, we all were sitting the movement, but it's very important. So they can learn from different points. It's not like always this point. They can really examine this more difficult Do you think that links to so that's another point? Like physical no, no, like it's like linking to the yeah. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're moving a little bit more into tools. Just on the messaging and on the, I think the thing goes on our thing, interesting debate.
and I think both our, our both options are interesting. Uh, and I'm just we're talking about a lot about children, so climate change is that defined as reaching children, or can it be a little bit more larger? Because I think probably children are interested in learning about different cultures, and they probably have stronger empathy than adults. And if we tell them people in Nigeria or Bangladesh or something because of climate change, that's going to be interesting to them and it's going to make them want to act. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure that it's such an ideal way to communicate to most adults, unfortunately. And also I'm concerned about how much pressure also that puts on children to, to tell them our lifestyle in the UK or in France or in Switzerland is being very dangerous for children all over the world. So, it's important to teach them that there are impacts in other places of the world, but it can't be too stressful or emotionally too harsh for them to tell them about it. That's true. You have to be careful of this, you know, hopelessness scenario. Yeah. I, I think it's much more because that's what really, the world really happens in the world. It's more like the state standing up for each other. Yes, that's, that's the way to message it. Yeah. I think when we're not, not talking about how to frame things, we're really only thinking about um, Western uh, kids. Like, we're just uh, in, in this, like, thinking about kids at, at our homes. But that's not the whole world. So, I myself, like, I don't know a lot about the world yet so i don't know how we can reach kids in south america or africa or like yeah, not the most developing countries but that i think that's very important as well to educate and kind of change in all countries yeah. Yeah. No, of I want to shift a little bit. We've got a second component to to messaging for climate education, which is really what is needed to ensure that climate education reaches more people. So how can we get climate education to a much wider audience than the one that's already reaching? What are some of the roadblocks that are preventing that, and how can we overcome those? Any ideas? Yes, first of all, we need to identify our target audiences. Mm -hmm. Okay. To, to help facilitate the border reach? Yes. And then... Uh, our message... What message do we want to add? Yeah. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you have five minutes to wrap up your discussions and come back to your chairs. Thank you. Yeah. So strategies for reaching out for the climate change message, and then I mean, there's there's one that always pops in mind that you know there's not enough financing, right? It needs more financing to have more. Climate education programs? Yes, I think financial issues are good. Normally, the last one we have tried is already. I think it should be up there. And I think from, from your experience when you're introducing yourself, you know, like how do you actually integrate climate education within the teaching that is already there? Or, you know, like yeah, that's that's why I, like that's what I say is you gotta reach the teachers because kids learn from models. So if the teachers just in everything they do are like doing good kind of, then you don't even have to name it. They just le learn that they should reduce waste, that they recycle, that they take care of each other, they um, can be self confident and so on. So. Yeah. And I think that if you if you look at this from this way, you don't even have to focus on finance. Because if you can, for example, reach the students, mm. then there's no like you don't have you don't need money then if the teachers themselves are aware of it. 
So maybe that's also a good less. Cut. You need money, but less. <laughs> you need less. less. Yeah. Everything needs money. That's true. That's true. That's true. That's true. We can definitely move it down. I, mean, I, I like that. But I mean, I'd like to explain. So I, I brought it up because it was actually one of the main points that our moderator brought up at the very beginning, which was really interesting. Um, that, you know, in the introduction of the ACE agenda of that, you know, but to facilitate that, we we'll get more states and more financial commitments to actually enable that. We need policy. But, uh, policy. Policy, yeah. But linking to that, we should teach us what I felt heard was also, um, using the existing structure, right? Okay. So, the existing... And, and expanding those. Whether that's formal education or informal education. Yeah. I feel like there's so much more to do to change the messaging and change the messaging. Uh, by applying a more effective message. Absolutely. Well, we could also, so, you know, also using social media. Yeah. If you like, make kind of that means yes, that we need to teachers, but also we need to get children and Um. And to what extent then? If I may, this, this is, uh, okay. is it also the responsibility of the companies that run social media? Because yes, the tools are there, but do we need like, you know, Facebook and Twitter and Google to kind of make it easier for climate messaging to come through? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's not even a question. <laughs> And, uh, well, we can say access to internet. Yes, that's true. Yes, access to internet. So whatever uh, where you are going, you have to have the access first. Yes, so minutes left. Yeah. And uh, this group should also uh, decide on a rapporteur. And that person should please take a seat here in, in this row and present the results of the group. Absolutely. Great, thank you. Um, so yeah, private sector engagement and using the, the power of the private sector and the advertising influence. I always think that's a good thing to try and aim for, but I don't know how applicable it is or like whether one can. I mean, a good example of social media would be like WWE Skype Hour. Yeah. It's just one of the biggest things. So that's usually, that's mainly done by social media. It's not, it's not a strong organization, but it's raising awareness. Yeah. But it's, it's just an hour. And, to what, and, and, and Twitter and Google and everybody picks that up, puts out the logo. But Shouldn't one get them to put out the logo every hour of the day in a way? <laughs> I think you should be increasing the social responsibility of like uh, businesses. And, like, for example, even like on TV shows, you should say you work with them to try and with them incorporate the climate message within like you know kids' movies, kids' TV shows. So. It should be like an underlying theme and it can be part of like oh. really reaching out to social responsibility. So yeah, and I think yeah, that's private sector engagement, getting them to really drive. I hope uh, everybody uh, enjoyed some interesting and fruitful discussions. Unfortunately, it's now time to draw your con conversions, conversations to a close, and I would like us to participants to return to their seats for presentation of each group's conclusions. So we came together and we discussed messaging for climate education. And the key question was how do you effectively get climate messaging out there? And we came up with a number of strategies. Um, and then we looked into, you know, how can one actually ramp up climate education and spread it to a broader audience. 
Um, and, and then we've also got a number of guiding ideas. So, like, we have to return to our seats. There's a meeting here at six o'clock, and we will not be able to go any further. Please. Okay. That'll be good. We break it up in two or three. No, no. Next time. Yeah. Which one do you want to do? Um. Yeah. That was tough. That's good. Perfect. Well done. Thank you so much, guys. Okay. It, it, it's really interesting because a lot of these issues are things that I struggle with in like my work environment. Message kind of to board all of it. Yeah. Where'd this one come from? We invite the reporters uh, to come over here. Reporter number one, two, three, four, and five. Uh, reporters of working groups are now invited to briefly share their findings which they should in do from uh, I will ask them to come in the front here and uh, they can do their presentations uh, from the from the front uh, table here. <coughs> I now invite group one to report on the outcome of their discussions. Group one. Please, uh, Please uh, confine your uh, responses to uh, conclusions to not more than three minutes, uh, as we have uh, a meeting scheduled after six here. Thank you. Uh, group one? Oh, I was group one. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, so we'll try to keep it within three minutes. Um, we had a very lively discussion with a, a lot of points, as you can see, so um, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, so our discussion focused on climate change education in the context of the NAPs and the NDCs. So how uh, could integration be possible in the, in the NDCs or NAPs? Um, we heard a very interesting example from the Dominican Republic who effectively integrated uh, these issues into the NDCs and they said it was really handy that they already had uh, legislation in place before so that they could refer to it. Um, one of the interesting points, maybe that's more of an overarching issue, is that we often see that um, now this whole idea of uh, ACE is maybe a little bit of a standalone topic and that it often and that the NDCs are more focusing really on completely on mitigation or on adaptation and are sometimes very quantitative and that these issues uh, fallout. So there was really this idea that maybe we should really look more to the linkages of how ACE contributes to adaptation, how ACE contributes to mitigation, or how ACE contributes to, for example, capacity building. And this might provide uh, ways into the into these NDCs or can like uh, uh, get more more access to things. Especially with regard to finance, we had um, uh, from Senegal. We had very, uh, as we also heard this morning with the speech from the co-presidency. Um, that, that finance access is really an important thing to get this going. And um, yeah, that, that maybe it's also a way to look at this 
different, yeah, looking for linkages between A's and the other topics can be also an avenue towards finance. Um, so that was really something that was discussed on how uh, to put fo to go forward. Um, Another thing we mentioned was uh, looking at um, how high level commitment can help to bring this forward. Um, so also maybe in the uh, looking towards future COPs, how maybe high level segments um, can also focus on this issue. Um, we also looked at the, at the private sector, like how collaboration with the private sector can help on education. There were some examples of that. Um, and, and there was also really a, like, yeah, on, also on capacity building that, um, also in the in the writing of the NDC that it's also really a thing um, yeah that you also need the capacity to to write this comprehensive NDC and to include all these things well I think that's three minutes so uh, yeah, I'll you. keep it with this uh, thank you group one I now invite group two to present their conclusions group two thank you very much um, our uh, topic was on how to integrate climate change education into a national curricula and uh, we were looking um, at the two, this, two different, op two different op um, possibilities to have is an overarching sub um, subject kind of another and it's an additional subject that you add onto the curriculum or um, to have it as a kind of a DNA of every subject integrated as many um, subjects don't really focus on the, the subject matter for their for teaching so just for example in in languages or in math you have some examples um, of totally different of which are totally unrelated to the subject you can calculate how many how many pv panels you put for a, for a, your house or you can calculate how long your car has can go with a certain amount of of, uh, of liters so um, there we, we came to the conclusion that it's important to have it um, as well as a separate subject, but also have it um, in all different subjects integrated. Um, then we should have the diff um, involvement of different, different stakeholders for, for, um, for getting it integrated. So to get there, there we can have them teaching in pedagogic schools to teach the teachers. Um, as they are uh, being formed, but also for in-service teachers to actually have the teachers who are now teaching, they should be updated. So like to get a new version of how, how to teach, right? Um, then the climate change education can may be made uh, part of every subject, um, if the textbooks, if every subject, and for doing so, um, there should be some sort of a willingness of policymakers um, to do this, and so maybe they will need some interministerial contact because usually the educational and the environmental minister are not necessarily in contact. Um, so uh, for doing this, there could be some sort of sharing also between different countries where they would have a con conference on textbooks and how to do it because the people from say Indonesia do not necessarily know how it's being taught in Norway so that they could then see and get to some some conclusions and um, also a more bottom-up network for all teachers and and schools so that would be my three minutes thank you very much Uh, thank you, Group 2. Uh, I now invite Group 3 to present their conclusions. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so the, the question for Group 3 was messaging for climate education. And uh, we really had two components. I'm going to hand over to Marie to uh, discuss the first component, which was to look at uh, what kind of messaging could be most effective to educate people on climate change. So really important is that we not use any more the words of like climate change because for teachers it's like, well, not climate change anymore because they hear it all over the day in the media. So we should make it more relatable that they really know what can they do and think in a positive way, like in the positive psychology. And it's kind of be inspiring that we not like using um, really like ne negative messages we are destroying everything, we should use positive messages, what we can do, 
was like upcycling, create something new. And um, we should think like a child because teachers need to educate children and they should know what's in the mind of the kids. So it's not should be abstract, it should be practical, hands on, that should really get be physical active and that they really applied like for example plants um, to, to, to plant trees or that we use garbage to make new fitness instruments that they can use for the daily activities to make them fit and so we want the teachers that they start to be creative and sing in a positive challenging way that they got the message yes we can handle it and that they got this message to bring it to the kids self-empowerment for the children and self-empowerment for the teachers yeah. great and <clears throat> um, building on that we, we had a second component which was uh, what is needed to ensure that climate education reaches a, a much broader audience um, and, and these are kind of analyzing some of the barriers and then how to overcome those um, so to, to reach the broadest audience you, you have to first know your audience and, and try and categorize them and, and identify specific strategies um, for your uh, climate messaging uh, using the effective climate messaging that we discussed. Um, <clears throat> one key component was to, to reach the teachers and, and it's really about training and retraining teachers, you know, making, empowering them to feel like they are on top of the, the knowledge and are able to share it on to their um, <laughs> Uh, their, their, their children uh, as well as the, their audiences. Um, we need to encourage policy and, and cross-ministerial dialogue um, using the existing structures. So there are very strong educational structures in place and we should definitely work with those. But on top of that, we also need a bit of financing and I think this was brought up earlier today to um, help uh, bring the ACE agenda forward. Um, then finally, we, we brought it a little bit more to using the interconnected world, the fact that we're all uh, connected through social media um, and, and encouraging uh, internet access to, to those that still lack it. But then also working with the private sector and, and those companies that um, hold in their hands the, the power of social media. So for example, the Google and Twitters and, and, and Facebooks to encourage them to uh, direct a lot more of their outreach and impact towards climate awareness and climate education um, and, and, and hence working within the private sector and using their finances as well as their uh, influential powers. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Group 3. Uh, I now invite Group 4 to present their conclusions. Group 4. Thank you. Um, so our uh, group, uh, we discussed about approaches, tools, and materials for climate change education. And so it was a very um, interesting talk because we uh, had different approaches, uh, south-north uh, uh, approaches. And we began with one um, so uh, interesting uh Division. So we first learn um, education and um, how to teach uh, those subjects with connect cognitive, behavioral, or social emotional uh, distinctions. So cognitive, so it's bringing you know, more information, uh, but it's not enough, as we uh, just uh, heard. We have to learn by doing, so to touch uh, the beh uh, behavioral side. But finally, we need to interact, to interact with people, with our relatives, with our communities. And especially when we are in indigenous um, areas where they have built for centuries knowledge and technology uh, adapted to their environment. So we have to use this uh, knowledge in a bottom up uh, approach and in, in order to uh, really solve local issues. And uh, so this is another method uh, 
to adapt the right message for the right people and using the right material, uh, and especially the materials uh, which was uh, created at the, at the place, local. Um, and it's uh, really interesting, so when we consider uh, UNESCO reports or guidelines, um, we, could, we can use them, but applying them uh, with this local knowledge. And finally, we, uh, of course, uh, sorry, uh, of course, um, considered technology as a new media and uh, apps, uh, virtual augmented reality, exactly, uh, like um, a kind of Tamagoshi uh, or uh, Pokemon Go uh, to, you know, consider our environment, uh, for example, in the future or right now in other place, or to see actually the impact of what we are doing uh, so that actually children and everyone can see uh, the actual impacts on our environment. Uh, and some other examples like concerts in uh, Hungary and uh, during festivals uh, or uh, other I mean, uh, events uh, we can find in our uh, uh, cities and uh, rural areas. Thank you. Thank you, Group 4. I now invite Group 5 to present their conclusions. Group 5. Yes, thank you. So we worked on the, or discussed about the engagement of non-party stakeholders in climate change education. And to support it, uh, we need a coherent structure. So from top to down, from national through regional and to local level, where the schools actually are. Um, secondly, uh, it can be very good and useful to have like non-traditional methods in education, uh, like a peer-to-peer, -peer, or you can uh, take in maybe NGOs or youth NGOs to the school and uh, make sure that it should be fun and you can use a creative process and uh, involve culture as well, uh, like theater or art, makes it much more fun. Um, third, uh, it's important to involve citizens in the policy making process so that, that it's meaningful for them and to make it in a proper way. And uh, finally, uh, you should also need some kind of funding from somewhere and either government or maybe businesses could come in there. Um, yes, those were our main points. Thank you, Group 5. We are now at the end of the first session of the fifth Dialogue for Action for Climate Empowerment. I would like to thank all presenters, speakers, and colleagues for your engagement and excellent contribution to today's discussions. I personally enjoyed the exchanges, which I found to be very enriching and valuable. Please note that the presentation slides from Today are shared on the UNOPCCC Secretariat website. Uh, and for tomorrow's program, uh, the slides should come on the screen. Yes, I strongly urge uh, all of you to participate in next session of the dialogue, which will take place tomorrow, 16th of May, from 3 to 6 p.m. in this room. And we'll focus on training and international corporations on this matter. I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow and wish you a pleasant evening. The meeting is adjourned. Sorry, I didn't. Sorry, I just realized.
I didn't think anyone noticed. I didn't think it. Next time, please check. Yeah.